So, and it, could everybody please mute? That's perfect. Um, so, a little bit about me. My name is Lisa Shannon. I'm an instructor here at SNHU. I have been doing this for a while now. Um, I, I, in my day job, I'm a principal uh, software developer. I write code for a living. I design complex computer programs. Um, my main languages are Java and Python. I spent many years writing in C and C++. I also do some JavaScript here and there, some HTML, some Bash scripting, um, and I'm sure whatever else they end up asking me to do. So I have a lot of experience programming, and um, I am here during these lectures to help answer your questions. If you have a question, go ahead and put it in the chat or unmute and say excuse me, and I will do my best to answer your questions as we move through the class. So what are we here for? We're here to learn to program Python. There are two things you need to learn to become a good programmer. You need to know the syntax and construction of your language. You need to know how to think like a computer programmer. I consider a programming language a tool in my toolbox of languages, I can, uh, the, the knowledge that I've developed over the years and that other programmers have developed over the years is the ability to understand how to take what someone needs and turn it in to an instruction set that the computer can use to do something because that's what programming is. It is creating an instruction set for the computer. So. Um, what do we have? We have a program and we have something called input process and output. So basically, and this hasn't changed since I started programming a very, very long time ago, um, you have input, which is something that comes into your program. It can be data. It can be a screen capture. It can be a keyboard or a mouse click. It can be traffic over a network. You do something with that. That's the process. Maybe you're doing arithmetic calculations. Maybe you're responding to something that happened in a game. Um, but that's the process. And the output is the result of the input plus the process. So it's basically an addition. Um, and those are the three things that we have to remember when we're talking about a program. That is at the most basic level. Uh, I, I used to work for a woman who called them gozintas and gozoutas. So you have a gozinta, that's what goes into the program. You have a gozata, that's what comes out of the program. And then you have what happens in the middle. Um, and we're going to be responsible for all of that. And programmers are responsible for all of that. So what do we have? The first basic construct that we have is something called a variable. And a variable is like glass. So you have a glass, and that glass can hold water. It can hold juice. It can hold air. You could put sand in it. The glass is just a vessel. That's all it is. It's a place to hold something. A, a variable is a place to hold something. And in this case, that something is data. It is a number, it's a string, it's a float, or it's a Boolean, or it's a collection. There are very few things that, that you really have the option of holding in Python. You can't hear anything, Peyton. Um, so, So let me show you, um, well, for a variable, there is a syntax. And there are some rules that are associated with a variable. Because a variable has a name. 
So if you think of that glass of water again, let's assume you wrote the name Lisa on that glass. So that glass and, and everything in it can be, can I have everybody mute please? Okay. I think it's Haley and I think I'm going to mute you. Uh, hold on. And Paul. Hi, Paul. Um, hi, Lisa. Hi, could I ask you to mute, please? Sure. Thank you. Unless you're asking a question, and then you can unmute. So a variable has a name. So it is a, you're writing a name with a marker on a, on a glass of water or sand or whatever's in that glass. And then you can reference that glass by a name. You can reference it by Lisa, or you can reference it by X. It doesn't matter. It's that you have a named place to put something. Um, if you were ever in kindergarten and you got to put your name on a cubby, it's the exact same concept. There's just a lot less things in Python that you can store in a variable. So I'm going to bring up something called PyCharm. Okay, PyCharm is the integrated development environment that we are going to be using um, in this class to do all kinds of things. And I believe next week you have to have downloaded it and done your first program in it. But I like to use this as my example space. So I, if I'm creating examples or I'm running examples, I do it in PyCharm so that I can demonstrate to you how to use PyCharm and also because PyCharm has some really great features to help people understand what's going on. So the first thing I'm going to do right now is I'm going to create a new Python file. So I'm going to create new and down here it's going to say Python file and I'm just going to say variable. That's going to be the name of my PY file. And you'll see that PyCharm has created an empty space for variable.py. So this will be different than what you're doing in Zybook this week. But I wanted to get you started on this so that when you next week you're familiar with PyCharm and you can do some of the things that it says. And for right now, ignore what's going on down here. Um, so a variable has a name, and I'm just going to call it my var. So right now, let me make this bigger. Right now, one of the nice things about PyCharm is when things are bad, it will tell you in red. You will get red squigglies. And that's because my var right now means absolutely nothing to Python. I have to tell it to mean something. And what I'm going to do in this case is I'm going to say it's going to equal, let's just say 10. The red went away, which means that Python, that PyCharm has checked this out and says, okay, that's valid. So what I have done is I have put the number 10 in something called my var. And later on, or in just a minute, I can reference the number 10 by my var. So if I say print, and you're going to learn about print this week, my var, it will print whatever the value in my var is. So I'm going to set this up to run variable. And by the way, print, well, remember we were talking input, process, output. Print is output. You are using the print function, because that's what this is, that Python gives you to output things to the console. When we're looking at it in PyCharm, the console is going to be down here. In Zybooks, the console is going to look a little different. So I'm going, whoops, why didn't it do that? Edit configuration, variable, okay. Variable, okay, run it. I don't know why my PyCharm's acting up. 
variable.py. Okay, I may have to restart my PyCharm. Let's try this again. Edit configuration. It's on variable. It's got 3, 8. Uh, here, I'm just going to add a new Python configuration. That should do it. Okay, Python was being a little bit temperamental there. Now we're good. What I noticed was that this was not changing. When I want to run Python, I have to tell it what to run in PyCharm. So in this case, it's going to be in, an, in a configuration, and this configuration has to be named, in this case, the same as my, py, my .py file. So I'm going to run this. What is it doing? Python error. Can't initialize the standard streams. Okay. I'm going to quit PyCharm because something is weird. And then give me just a second. I'm just going to go out onto my iCloud drive and open this. So I apologize for that. Um, They talk about a program like a recipe. And as I said, a, a program is a set of instructions. That set of instructions, you know, when you think of recipe or you think of talking to someone and giving them some instructions, you think that they understand the language that you're talking about. That's not always 100% true with a computer. You do not, Brandon, you do not need to declare variable types in Python. Python is not a strongly typed language like Java or C and C++. And for those of you who don't know what um, we're talking about, um, we will get to that. Um, so for right now, let's go back to my variable and we'll see if it runs. If not, I'm giving up for tonight. Nope. There's a problem with my PyCharm, and I apologize for that. Um, this is not a problem. Why does it think it's doing ABC? Okay. Close everything. If not, I'm just going to create a new project. My apologies. This doesn't normally happen. Okay. Okay. So, did somebody just join? If you could put your mute on, I would appreciate that. Javier, did you just join? Uh, somebody just joined. That um, let's see. Look at my attendees. Everybody should be muted. Yes, I just joined. Okay, could you mute, please? Here. There we go. Okay. So I was having a problem with my pie charm, so I've now created a whole new project. So my apologies for that. So now I'm going to create a new Python file. I'm going to call it variables. And I'm going to do my var equal 10, and I'm going to get back to print my var. I just have to set up my interpreter. By the way, the instructions for this are in next week's uh, assignment. Let me make this bigger. I'm just going to add my run configuration. And again, the assignments are, this is in the assignments for next week. I apologize. I usually have this all set up. I don't know why my PyCharm was being weird. 
Okay. So, let's try running it. There we go. So, I have a variable named myvar. I know myvar is a variable because it is on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. You guys will hear me say this over and over and over again for the first three weeks of class because I find that, especially with new students, they don't understand how to read a program. So we teach about how to write, a lang write in a programming language, but we don't teach about how to read that language back to ourselves. And that's as equally important. So I'm going to sound like a broken record. My var is a variable. You know it's a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. The current value of my var is 10. I have a function called print. I know it's a function because it opens with a parenthesis and somewhere down the line it closes with a parenthesis. In between that, in this case, I have a variable called myvar. What Python does is it goes into its memory and it says, do I have anything called myvar? Oh, I do have something called myvar. The value is 10, so I'm going to print out 10. So you see 10 down here, and I'm sorry, I can't make this any bigger. So that's what we just did. We just wrote a program. And the program does very little, but it is the beginning of what we need to know. So they're talking about computational thinking. Basically, computational thinking is how do I talk to the, how do I talk to the computer? Because a computer, while we see, you know, amazing games running on it and all kinds of wonderful applications, computers are essentially dumb. They just do a lot of dumb things in series very, very, very rapidly. So we have to learn to break up our normal thinking into a way that makes sense for a computer. Computers are binary machines. They have two states, on and off, and that's it. And they have two resources. They have space and speed. So on, off, space, speed. That's what you get with a computer. We think of it, a lot of people think when they first approach programming language that they're just going to be able to talk to it like they talk, you know, like talk over Snapchat. But that's not the case. And so what we, we have to learn is how do we figure this out? How do we figure out how to talk to the computer? And that is equally as important as learning the syntax. So what do I mean by syntax? Syntax is how do I write grammatically correct in a language? Okay? So removing this, this program won't run because I just made a syntactical error. What do I get when I make a syntactical error? I get a syntax error. And this just says invalid syntax. Not very helpful. As a person who once wrote a programming language, I can assure you that computer programmers are the worst people to write error messages and all computer programs are written by computer programmers. So on compilation, you will probably almost never get a helpful message. I remove the equal sign and nothing works. I get all these wonderful red squiggles, and that's because I made a syntactical mistake. So to undo that, I put the equal sign back in, and everything works. So that's what I mean by syntax, okay? That's what I mean by grammar. You have to have it right. If I take away a closing parenthesis, I'm going to get another syntax error. Unexpected EOF while parsing. Again, not helpful, especially to a new programmer. It doesn't say, excuse me, you left off the right, the right closing parenthesis. But it does show you that you've made a syntactical or grammatical error when writing the program. So let's fix this, and we'll go back to Zybooks. Um, programming using Python. Basically what they're talking about here is how to use the interpreter. And um, you are eventually, you're going to use the interpreter somewhat, 
but Zybooks covers all of that up for you, and so does PyCharm. Okay? Python can be written in two ways, interpreted or compiled. Okay? Interpreted means that it goes down each command in succession and does exactly what that says. Compiled means that you are turning it to a language that's closer to the machine. It would be harder for you to read as a human being, but it's much closer to the machine language. You can do either, and when it is interpreted, you can run it interactively. We will not be running interactively in this class through the interpreter. It's good to understand that you can do it. However, um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. So they're talking about some things here, a statement, an expression, an assignment. We just went through those, OK? So this is a statement. That's, that's the simplest statement you can probably get in Python. This is a statement. It's just another statement. That's all it is. So a line of code is a statement, an expression. You can slice that up a lot of different ways. The important part is that you know how to write this syntactically. Um, basic input and output. OK. Everything that comes in to Python externally is a string. It just is. That's the way Python handles it. If you put a 1 in, if somebody enters a 1, and I'll show you how to do that in a little bit, um, Python's going to think it's a string. It doesn't know that it's a 1. It just knows that it is a character representation of a 1. Everything you output from Python with this basic class is a string. It's that simple. Um, so just remember that, that when you're thinking input and output, you have to think strings. Again, print is output. Input process output. Print is the output part, and you'll be using it a lot, and you'll be doing some formatting, all kinds of stuff. Um, here they talk about new lines and ends. Okay. So if I have, let me do this. So I've just added another statement and another print statement. OK. Why did I do that? Well, this is why I did that. And actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this through the debugger. Because the debugger will show you what happens step by step in Python. So I'm going to hit the debug variables. And this blue line tells me what line of code I am on that has not yet been executed. Okay, So Python hasn't done anything. This is just strings on a screen at this point. If I step over this, PyCharm says, OK, I've now set my var equal to 10. I'm down here. I've got my var equal to 10. It knows it's an integer right there, int. We'll talk about types in a minute, too. I'm going to print my var. I'm now going to change the value of my var. I'm not creating a new my var. It's all the same name. I'm simply removing the value 10 and putting the value 12 in its place. And now I'm going to print my var again. Oh, by the way, here's the console. This is where the output goes. So I've already output 10, and I'm going to output 12. And you'll notice that 1, that 10 is on a line, and 12 is on a different line. So I have used what's called a new line. A new line is how you tell the output to basically do a carriage return. If you're typing and you hit the return key, a new line is equivalent to typing on the keyboard and hitting the return key. But maybe I don't want to hit the return key. Maybe I want to just add a space. What I can do in Python is I can tell it how to end. So 
again, syntax is important, a comma, the word end equal, end is special here, can't make it anything else other than end, has to have an equal sign, and that what you want it to end with. And in this case, I want it to end with a space, not a new line. So if I debug this again, by the way, this is step over, so I use this and I step over this line of code and it will execute it. I'm going to step over this line of code, I'm going to come back here to the console, execute it, I'm going to now step over line 5, I'm going to step over line 7. The program has ended and you will see the difference. There is a space here, not a new line, and there is a space because of this. By the way, this comma is important. If you get rid of the comma, it won't run. You'll get one of those fun little syntax errors that we programmers are great about just telling you but not really describing what they are. So those are some important things because you will need that when you do a lab. Um, that's the challenge activity. New line characters. Okay, so there is actually a character sequence for a new line. It's an escape character, and it is used um, sometimes. With Python and print, you don't actually need to put a new line in a lot of things. You normally need to you figure out what the new line is when you're reading something in like from a file. But it is a slash n. It is, that is a character combination. You can't do a slash or do an n. You have to do a slash n. It's a specific character combination in Python, and it will cause a new line. So I will just use their example here real quick, and I'll say print one, two, Three. So I'm just going to run this and it print one, two, three. Because I had the new line. If I take this out, let's just say I take this one out. Whoops. And I put a space there. It's going to print one space, two, and three. So that's what a new line does. going and if I'm going by anything too fast please let me know. Input. We talked about input process and output. We've talked a little bit about process. We've talked a little bit about output. Now we're going to introduce the input. Input is how you take something externally from the program and read it in. In um, it, it can be a mouse click. Um, most of what it will be in this class are text strings. Uh, when we get farther on in the class, it will be files. But for right now, it's a text string. So I'm just going to create a new file here. I'm going to call it simple input. And simple input, I'm going to use a function called input right here. This function allow will make Python wait while you type something into the console. And then it will take that thing that you've typed into a console and do something with it. Usually what you want to do something with it is that you want it to put it in a variable. So you can use it in your process. So if we go out and we try this, I'm going to say um, I'll just use my var again because I'm not creative tonight. So I have a variable called my var. I know it's a variable because it's on the left hand side of a single equal sign. On the right hand side of that equal sign, I have I am using our new function input. Input is a special function provided by Python that will halt processing until it gets input from the console. Inside of that, I have put a string 
make it a little nicer, which is generally a direction to somebody on what you want them to put in. This is important because it's going to go towards your project that you're going to turn in in week seven. And then I'm going to print out my VAR. Pretty simple, not really doing anything with it, but let's put this through the debugger because I like debuggers. So, uh, oops, my bad. I did not change, in PyCharm, you have to change the running Python program. So I did not change it to simple input, so it started to run variable again. I've just changed it to simple input. I'm going to debug it. So I'm on line one. I know I'm on line one because of that blue line. When I step over right now, let me back up for a second. There are two tabs here. There's debugger and there's console. Console is where you're going to put things in and you're going to see things come out. Debugger only happens in, when you debug, but it shows you what's going on in the running program. So I like to use the debugger a lot in these lectures. So I'm going to step over my var. And now you'll see something different. This didn't get populated with anything like it did in, in, when we were doing variable. It didn't get populated because we haven't populated anything yet. It is sitting here waiting on this input statement. If I go to console, it says input something that came from right here. And I'm going to say, I like IT140. Yes, I can be a little corny. I hit the enter key, and what we see on the debugger is I now have a string. My var has a value, which is a string. It says, I like IT140. And so that was my input and my output to the console. I'm just printing my var, and my var has, I like IT140. I could have typed in my dog's name there, and it would put, let's do that. Let me just run it this time. Input something. I'm going to input my dog's name, and it will simply output my dog's name. So that's what input does. It halts the program so you can type something in on the console. Now, Zybooks is going to act a little different because you're going to put the input in in Zybooks sometimes. And sometimes Zybooks is going to expect that there is an input statement and it's going to automatically inject things for you to test whether your code is correct. So be careful because Zybooks can be um, a bit tricky. Errors. Well, I've just showed you a couple of errors. Um, and errors can be syntactically or they can be logically. I've shown you syntactical errors, okay, this whole syntax error thing. And you will undoubtedly get syntax errors. Everybody gets syntax errors. I still get syntax errors. There are days when I have spent, you know, a week writing Java and then all of a sudden I'm dropping over to Python. And I find myself typing Java in a Python terminal because it happens. Logical errors are different than syntax errors. Logical errors are what we like to call bugs. We didn't do the processing right. And there's nothing wrong. Python's not ever going to say, hey, there's a syntax error here. It's just going to go along happily because one of the most beautiful things about computers is they do exactly what you tell them to do. One of the most frustrating things about computers is they do exactly what you tell them to do. So understand that syntax errors will run, the program will run fine, but it won't calculate properly. So you have to think about that when you are writing your code and when you're testing it. Because a third of the battle is writing the code, two thirds of the battle is testing it to make sure it works correctly. And I'm not joking about that ratio. We always say that you should have two thirds that for the whole problem, one third of your time should be spent writing code, the two thirds of your time should be spent writing tests to make sure that your code runs well now and in the future. 
Style guides. I don't worry about style guides. You guys can read it. If your teachers enforce a certain style guide, that's completely fine. Um, there is flavor and function in my book. Flavor is the style of your code. Okay. There are certain things that you have to do, like when you indent. Um, Mommy, but Mommy. Could you please uh, mute? Thank you. There are other things that are not necessarily um, required, like how you name your variables. I like to name my variables extremely descriptively. My coworkers think I use long names. I think they use short names and they're not descriptive enough to make the code easier. It's flavor, it really doesn't matter. What matters is, in the end of the day, the code works and it's maintainable. Why white space matters, okay. Python is a language that is ruled by case and space. What do I mean by that? Everything in Python has, first of all, if I, if I talk about case, I'm talking about case sensitivity in variable names, in uh, function names. So I have my var. If I simply do this one thing on line three, change it to my var, first of all, PyCharm is going to say, sorry, you have a syntax error. But wait a minute, M-Y-V-A-R, M-Y-V-A-R. Shouldn't they be the same? The answer is no. The answer is no, because for Python, it's a case-sensitive language. This lowercase v, this uppercase v, means that the myvar on line one is not the same as the myvar on line three. And if I try and run this, oops, let me stop the old one. If I try and run this, it says input something. I am running an interpreted program, so it's going to wait for something. I'm going to type ABC, and when I hit the enter key, I now get that my var is not defined. If you are thinking that that variable should be defined, the first thing you should do is see if the case matches. In this case, it doesn't. I change that to a capital V, and it will run just fine. So that's what I mean by Python is a case sensitive language. Python is also a space sensitive language. What do I mean by that? Well, right now, my var and print are lined up in the same column. Okay, This is starting at the very left hand side. This is starting at the very left hand side. If I move this over two spaces, first of all, PyCharm will give me an unexpected indent. And when I run it, I'm going to get an unexpected indent error. And that, why is that happening? Because Python works on the alignment. Unlike languages like Java and C or C++ that have something that says this is the end of a line, Python doesn't have that. So Python relies on the fact that you line things up right. And right now, things aren't lined up right because I simply put two spaces in front of this print. So if I backspace, whoops, and I run it again, it runs just fine. So cases and spaces. Python is a case-sensitive language, and spaces are important. So attention to detail. They can talk to you about being in attention to detail forever. The real issue is that you need to understand how to read a program after you write it or while you're writing it. You have to understand how to read it. You have to understand how to use the tools to make it easier to do your job. Okay? And that the syntax errors you get are not always going to be descriptive. So here's just an example of a salary calculation. The salary calculation is you've got a variable named hourly wage. It is set to the value of 20. You're going to print the annual salary is. You're going to do a calculation after you print it. You're going to say the monthly salary is. You're going to do a calculation after you print it. And they say the above is wrong. Change the 1 so that the statement outputs 
monthly salary. So this is a logical error because right there, and they're trying to teach you, you have to do attention to detail. So, um, so you, would, you will simply have to fix that so that you can get the monthly salary um, for each employee, for the employee. Output art. This one gets people sometimes, but basically all you're doing is you're printing things. You're just printing stuff out to the terminal. Um, lab 1.9. I want to go over how to read this, um, how to read these problems because they often, I don't believe in this, in, in my educational experience, we don't teach students how to translate a word problem into doing something. And now we're asking you to translate a word problem into writing a new language. So this can be somewhat daunting and it can get confusing. So let's do a little bit of reading of this initial lab. Um, basically they're talking about that Mad Live activities have a person provide various words and they're used to complete a short story in supposedly unexpected and funny ways. Okay, so you're going to complete a program to read four variables from input and store these variables, store the values in the variable's first name, generic location, whole number, and plural noun. The program uses the input values to output a short story. So, um, for example, Eric, Chipotle, 12, and cars, Eric went to Chipotle to buy 12 different types of cars. If the input is Brenda, Philadelphia, 6, and Bell, Brenda went to Philadelphia to buy six different types of Bell. So what they give us here is they give us this, um, type your code in to read the values here, and then they give you the output. So let's take the output, and we're going to do a modified version of that. I'm not going to give you everything that goes with this. But um, hold on. New file. OK. But well, we are going to do an exa a partial example. So I'm going to say lab 1.9. And we're going to take this. I'm just going to comment it so we have it. So first thing they've asked us to do is they've asked us to input and store, com complete the program to read four values from input and store the values in variables. First name, generic location, whole number, and plural noun. So why don't we start by just doing first name and generic location. So I need to create a variable called first underscore name. The variable, so it's going to be first underscore name. We're given that one. How do I make it a variable? Well, it's going to be on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. Well, what is supposed to be on the right-hand side of that single equal sign? Well, let's go back and look. So read four variables from input and store the values in variables. This is telling me I have to use the input function. Now, PyCharm, or Zybooks is weird, so you won't actually put anything in between the parentheses for the input. So I'm going to say input, and there's not going to be a prompt, and that's because of Zybooks. Now, I'm going to do the same for generic location. And I'm going to say input again. Let me make that a little neater. And make it bigger. Is that easier? I hope that's easier to read. So I now have two variables. I have first name. I'm using the input function. Generic location. I'm using the input function. Now what do I want to do? I want to print them out. So I'm going to use the print statement. And this is just the syntax they're using now. I'm going to do first underscore name, comma, went to. I'm just going to start with first name right now. 
So I am going to debug this. And by the way, when we get farther along into these lectures, I won't be actually typing in the uh, programs. We'll just be using ones because you don't need to see me typing in all the time. For this class, I think it's important. So I've just set up a configuration for Lab 1.9. I'm going to debug it. So I'm on line one. I don't have any variables. I'm going to step over. Because I'm using the input function, Python is waiting for me to type something in. I'm going to say first name is Lisa, and I hit the enter key. You now see it go to line two. Python is waiting for me to type something in again. Generic location is home. Now, I'm going to step over. So I've got first name went to. Let's see what comes out on the console. I'm going to step over and it says Lisa went to. Okay, so Lisa went to begins part of what we need to do for the program. So let's look at the print syntax here real quick. I have the print, the name of the print function I have a left open parenthesis. I have my variable first name. I know it's a variable because it's on the left hand side of a single equal sign. I have a comma. This is new from when I was using print with MyVar. Comma just tells Python that you kind of need to expect something different on the other side. It can be another variable. In this case, it's a string. Everything in Python, in quotes, is a string. And it can be a single quote or it can be a double quote. Then I have my string of went to. Now you'll see down here that they have single quotes. It doesn't matter as long as they match. That does not match and it won't run. Went to with, with an opening double quote and a single closing quote doesn't work. It has to be opening single and closing single, or opening double and closing double. So if we think about the generic location and we look at this pattern, the pattern would be to add a comma for the next thing that Python has to deal with, and that would be generic location. That, by the way, is nice. PyCharm does uh, tab complete. And then the next thing I have to say is to buy, OK? So I'm going to say to buy. Whoops. Buy. So now let me run this again. I'm going to say Lisa and home. And it said Lisa went home to buy. So we now have an idea of how to do this lab. Um, and so you guys need to finish it. You're going to need to look at defining the other two variables whole number and plural noun, accepting input for those variables, and finishing this off in such a way that when you put it in run mode, anything that Zybooks sends to that will be OK. OK, lab 1.10, basic warm up, basic output with variables. Um, so they've, they've uh, cut this up into a couple different Things. And basically what you have is the user is going to input two different things. You're going to output square and cubed, and then you're going to get a second user input and output the sum. So that seems like a lot, but it really isn't. We've already done everything. So you see they're giving us usernum int now. What is an int? What did, I, what did we do here? Let me create a new file. Oops, create a new file. Sorry. So I want to show you a couple of things for this. Type conversion. 
Right now, everything we've done is a string, except for my bar. But I need to sometimes change a string into an int because I cannot do arithmetic with a string. So let me let me um, give you an example. My stir equals one. My int equals one. Result equals my stir my stir plus my int. Now, right now, I'm syntactically correct. Everything works. If I run this, let me add the configuration first. If I run this, I'm going to get an error. I didn't get any red squiggles, but I got an error. Okay? The error is that it can only concatenate stir, not int into stir. So what is happening here? Because this one is in quotes, it's a string. Because this one isn't, it's an integer. I can only do arithmetic with integers and floats. So there's this concept of type. For those who have never programmed before, everything has a type, whether you tell it that it has a type or not. In Python, you don't actually have to tell it that it has a type. In other programming languages, you have to tell it that it has a type. So Python assumes everything's a string and that you want to do string stuff until you tell it differently. Here, I didn't tell it differently, but I gave it a string and an integer. So Python assumed that I wanted to do string stuff, which means I wanted to concatenate, which means put one on back of the other, for my stir plus my int, but I didn't want to do that. What I want to, let, let's say I want to add them together as integers. I have to change my stir to, some, to an integer. The way I do that is I use the int function. And it will turn my stir into an int. So if I run this, whoops, print result. If I run this, I get 2. Now, what if I do the opposite? What if I now say um, opposite equals my stir plus stir my int? So what did I just do? I left my stir as a string. Now I'm using the stir function to change my int into a string. So I will print opposite. So if I run it now, what I have is I have two ones basically next to the other, and opposite is a string. I didn't create 11. I didn't add 1 and 1 and get 11. I took the string 1 and I took the string my int, the string representation of my int, and put them back together. That's all I did. So that's the difference. So what we're talking about here is we're talking about taking something that is coming in from the outside and turning it into an integer. So in this example, and I'm just going to make these comments for now, and this is just how to make a lot of line of comments. If I want to have user input, sorry, equal int, enter a number, let's see what it looks like in the debugger. If I debug this, it's waiting for enter a number. I'm going to enter 10. Oops. I'm going to step over. Whoops. What did I do? Oh. I'm, I apologize. Ignore what I did the first time. I make mistakes too. I needed to say the result 
of the input needs to be made into an integer. So I have taken the input function and I have completely enclosed it in parentheses with the int on the outside. And then what that will do is it will take whatever I put in and turn it into an int. So now let's see if I can do this correctly. So I'm going to step over this. It's waiting for a console. I'm going to enter 10. You will see if I go back to the debugger that the user input is an int and it's 10. And then I'm going to continue on and it's just going to print 10. Now what would happen if I didn't put that in there? Let's see. So I am just going to set this up in the debugger again. I'm going to step over. I'm going to go to the console. I'm going to put 10. I'm going to hit the enter key. And I'm going back to the debugger and it says it's a stir. If it's a stir, I can't, I can't multiply by itself. So that's what that int was for. Oops, I'm just going to stop this. So I'm going to put the int back here because I do not want that to be a string. So if we go back and look at what this says, it says output the input squared. So basically the input times the input again. Then you're going to get a second user input and output the sum. Now when you do this, you have to make sure for Zybooks that you output this stuff exactly. So it's going to say enter integer 4. You entered 4. So somebody put that 4 in. You're not going to print that 4 out. There's a space here. Zybooks cares about spaces. You're going to say 4 squared is 16. So 4 is whatever number you put in. It's whatever number you entered. There's nothing magical about 4. It could have been 12. Then you're going to do 4 cubed. Again, remember the double exclamation points. And then you're going to say enter another integer. And you're going to do with the second integer, you're going to say four, the first input plus the second input is and then whatever the sum is. And then you're going to multiply them. So that's how you do lab 1.10. 10.1 variables and assignments. I know I'm going a little long. Um, I hope you guys can stay around. I will do my best to wrap this up soon. Um, in a program, a variable is a named item. So we already went through this part. Yes. Zybooks yelled at me for not putting the double, the, the double uh, exclamation point and stuff. Yes, it will. You have to be very careful with Zybooks. Um, it is, it can be a frustration maker for students because they're looking at something and they know that their output is right and somewhere in there there's a space or there's an escape character. So I, I feel your pain, Brandon. Um, we've already talked about what a variables are and the single equal sign. So identifiers. Uh, so basically, we talked about cases and spaces. So you can also have underscores and digits in a variable name, but you can't have special characters. You can't have an at sign. You can't have an exclamation point. There are some very, very special function names that we'll get into later. You don't have to worry about them now. Function, uh, Zybooks has keywords. And we haven't gotten into a lot of them yet, but we will start getting into a lot of them. So know that if it's a keyword in Python, you cannot use it as a variable name. You cannot use the word and as a valid variable name because and is a keyword. Um, this is a style guide for identifiers. Don't worry about it. Do take a look at table 1.12.2. These are your keywords. Don't use them. Don't try and use them as a function name. You'll get funky errors that computer programmers wrote. 
So we've talked a little bit about numeric types. There are two numeric types. There's integers and there's floats. An integer is basically a number without a decimal place, the same as it is in math. A float is a number with some number of decimal places afterwards. So if you're doing most scientific calculations, you're probably dealing with floats. Um, and why is there a difference between an integer and a float? The float takes up more space in memory than an integer does. That's why there are two different ones. Now, for integers and float, we, we learned about int as a converter. We also have the same thing for a float. So you have the built-in function float, which will take something from a string and make it into a float. The other thing to remember is that if you are doing any mathematics between an integer and a float, the float wins, which means you will always come out with a decimal place. Here's just some energy to mass conversions, arithmetic expressions. Um, so in Python, here are the basic expressions, just like you have in math, except I think for the exponent. More Python expressions. Um, so basically, what this is, is um, you can, it, it's just like mathematics. That's the best thing way I can say it. Parentheses matter, and there's an order of operation. Uh, OK. So here's something that they kind of, I think, they kind of hide on you. Um, and it is format modifiers, because you really don't get into format modifiers until week two. And a format modifier is just something that allows you to print out um, a, a string the way you want it. I tend to use, when I do this, I tend to use um, dot format. So if I were doing this, I could say print. Um, this was the user input dot format. Whoops. User input. So what did I just do? What I just did was I said I want this to be my output, and then hold a space here because there's something coming back after me afterwards. And I can do a dot format, which is a function that you can do on a string. And then I will put the variable or the value that I want to be put in this place. So this is a placeholder. This is what goes into the place. And this is how it gets there. Now, this is nice and handy because I can do all kinds of things with it. Now, the other thing you can do is for floats. So if I go if I'm going to enter a float and I want to print that float in a specific way, I can say print F, which will print the float with two decimal places after it. Could somebody please mute? So if I run this, whoops, forgot that. If I run this, and I everybody not needed. Hopefully everybody's muted now. Um, I'm going to enter a float one two two three three four four. Sorry, one point two two three three four four, and I'm going to hit the enter key. Oops, I did that wrong. Okay, let's do that again. One 
1.23344, and I did it wrong again. Percent 2F. I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank. My brain goes nuts after 10 o'clock. Colon point 2F dot format. That was right. Maybe it's the colon in front. I'm going to try this one more time if I'm not going to belabor the point. If I get it wrong this time, we'll just assume that, because my brain shuts off at 10 o'clock. I apologize. 23344. And then we have, there we go. I forgot the colon. That was a syntax error that Python didn't catch. So what did I do here? Okay, what I did was I told Python how to, that I only wanted two decimal places after the integer part of the float. So on the, from the point onward, I only wanted two spaces. Remember this, and unfortunately, I think it's coming up in one of your labs. So let's get to the rest of the lab. Division and modulo, division is like division. One of the things you are going to need to remember, and I will remind you next week, is the floor operator. So read this over. You don't need it this week. You will need it. If not next week, you'll need it in week three. And I think you'll need it again in week five. But I'll point those out when we get there. Module basics. Um, basically what we're writing this class is scripts. There are also something called modules so that you can basically create a library of programs and put them into a module and then load the module in. This is great because there's lots of modules out there that you can be used for lots of different things. They have a math module. The math module allows you to do all kinds of interesting math. If you're in my class and they're asking you to do certain arithmetic, and you want to go out and play with that math module, I'm completely happy because you're expanding beyond the boundaries of the class. I cannot answer for other instructors. So these are some of the standard math functions that you have. Um, you guys can read over them. Representing text. This is something important to understand. Um, every single character in um, Python has a numerical and a hexadecimal equivalent. So basically, a space is 32. That's its numerical equivalent. An E is 69. It is just important not to necessarily know what they are, but to know that they exist. Everything has a numerical equivalent. Now we have common escape sequences. An escape, and basically they are um, invisible characters. And sometimes you need to take, um, because of the use of the backslash, you need to be careful how you use backslashes in print statements. And that's all they're telling you here. And we'll go through that more next week. This is just some number games, divide by x. So basically here, what we're doing is we're taking in two integers. So, um, so one's going to be user num. This is going to be the name of your first variable. We're going to use the input statement. This is the name of your next variable. We're going to use that as an input statement. And you're going to divide user num by x three times. So you're going to basically say um, user num is input, x is input. User num divided by input. You're going to set that equal to something. You're going to say user num divided, the, the new value divided by input, and the third value divided by input. I hope that was clear. Um, and I will have some information about these up on the YouTube channel. This is one that can be a little difficult for students because it is a little bit more complex. So basically, they're just estimating the average calories burned for a person. So write a program using age, weight, and heart rate and time. Output the average calories burned for a person. 
I'll put each floating point value with two digits after the decimal point, which can be achieved by following. We did this in, in this last program. Um, so the output would be calories colon with a space, the calories, sorry, the actual calories burned, and calories. So basically what we're doing here is we're inputting five things, I think. Age, weight, heart rate, time. So four things. You're going to have an input for each of those, an input line for each and every one. Now, you have to not necessarily go with exactly what they're saying here. Because notice, like heart rate, there's a space there, it would not be a valid variable. So you're going to have to write, rewrite a little bit of this. Don't take this for exactly valid Python code. And then basically you're going to, this is the print statement you're going to use. Copy this into your code. So you're going to have a variable called calories. Calories with a lower C is going to equal this, but with your real live variable names, because things like heart rate aren't a ver valid variable name because there's a space. So this is really about input and output. They, for the most part, give you process, but you got to input four variables and you got to output the calories with the appropriate format. Um, input and type conversion. We did some type conversion before. Basically, what they want to do is they want you to do a little arithmetic and a little bit of type conversion, and they break it up into a couple of different parts. So, the user is going to input an integer between 32 and 126. A float, a character, and a string. So, you're going to have four inputs. So there's four variables with input statements afterwards. And then, um, okay, and then you're going to output them on a single line separated by a space. So the question becomes, how did we do that? Well, we did that by using that end statement. Where was that? Simple input? Nope. Where was it? Uh, sorry, I'm looking for it. end right here. When they talk about separating it by a space, that's what you're doing. Actually, you're doing this. You're doing comma, space, end, equal, quote, space, quote. So that's what you're going to be doing. And then the next set is you're going to output them in reverse. So you... Put, you're going to print them and then print them in reverse. And then you're going to convert the integer to a character by using the care function. So it's used just like int and just like float, except you're, um, so what you're doing is you're taking that first number that was input between 32 and 126 because you want it to be a readable character and using the care function to convert it to its character. So that's what they're doing, and they've given you a little bit of a start. So, and then we get in to week two. Does anybody have any questions? I know those that last bit was a bit quick. Um, all of these will be put up on the YouTube channel, and I'll be sending the link out to the professors. Um, so... Any questions? Going once. Oh, my YouTube channel. Let me get that real quick. Okay. Ignore all that stuff. This is my channel. Let me put the link in. And it also has things from previous terms up there as well. If, and, and they may cover other things. So that's the YouTube channel. Um, 
I'll give everyone a second to copy it that wants to. Um, and I think that's it for tonight. Yes. Um, they do have some extra requirements. Basically, you need to add some comments. And your code needs to be readable. That's, that's what those rubric requirements come down to. Is there any specific requirement, Brandon, that you have a question about? I'm going to assume that's a no. So I am going to uh, stop sharing my screen. I'm going to stop the recording. Ah. Um, my suggestion to all students is comments are there to help the instructor understand that you know what you're doing. So. Putting comments in isn't bad. If you feel that it's important um, to add a comment, go ahead. I don't require, especially on the short sections, students add a lot of comments. I'm okay with them saying, you know, add, you know, doing the calculation for calories, convert this to a float. Those are those are fine. They don't have to be really long. So I'm going to stop the recording.